chapter and um, for over a year now and the host there kept nudging me why don't you do this in Hong Kong so here I am um, and loving it and I actually need to get over my fear of public speaking so here I am <laughs> <laughs> so this is our fifth event and I'm still practicing but um, you know I would like to just tell you a little bit more about creative learnings so Creative Mornings was started out of New York by Tina Roth Eisenberg, and um, that was in 2008. So the, the, the special thing about Creative Mornings, the unique thing, um, other than like TED Talks and things like that, uh, Creative Mornings has a global theme every month. So the, you know, every chapter always um, finds a speaker that can share some sort of story or tie into the theme in, in some way, shape, or form. Um, but you know, it's very fluid. Um, we would not be here today without the help of a huge team of people, um, volunteers. Um, everyone is volunteering their time to put this event together. Um, so we and we also have a corporate sponsor and a load of sponsors who have helped us get here today. Um, so we would, one of the corporate global sponsors is Squarespace. So they provide web-based tools. Um, so anything kind of online, and they help promote in the headquarters and globally and keep us running. Um, we'd like to say a huge thank you to Platform. Um, they've also been very generous in not only offering their space, but offering a wall for us to spray paint, which is amazing. So, so that's incredible. Um, thank you to Pacific Coffee uh, for providing and helping wake us up this morning. Um, if you have any interest in corporate events and catering as well from Pacific Coffee, um, I'm sure you can speak <coughs> to Yuki, um, who's here today. And SOAT um, for providing us with popcorn for breakfast. <laughs> what would our parents think? <laughs> um, but they also are fantastic for doing corporate events, um, gifts, packages. Um, Savvy used them for Christmas this year, and our clients were just like, we're completely addicted, so it's great. Um, thank you to Graffiti for Hire, um, who provided one of their artists, Sabotage. Uh, to come in yesterday and do this art artistic uh, presentation for Ink for us. So please, at, after the event, get some photos, tweet, to share, share the artistry. Um, and thank you to Cranberry, who have, for the last three events, um, helped us with videography and photography. So, amazing. Volunteers, um, we have actually have our, a growing list of volunteers, which is fantastic. Um, so some of them are you know, just in, in, interested in the creative community and want to help out. Um, and others have really specialized skills, such as the photography and video, which is we always have a need for. Um, we've also had um, a huge amount of help, especially recently, from the CRED Communications PR team. Um, they have actually got us in Time Out magazine, in the Metro Pop. They've got us booked to be on the radio on Monday, or <laughs> it's quite scary. But, um, and you know, others from Savvy Team who have just taken on additional workload to be here. Um, and then several other volunteers with various backgrounds from advertising to motion graphics, etc. So thank you everybody. If you would like to hashtag us, um, the global account is created, hashtag Creative Morning. Local is hashtag CMHK and follow us at Hong Kong underscore CM. So I have the pleasure of introducing you to Bonnie Chan Wu, who is a super successful and <laughs> entrepreneur CEO of Icicle Group. Um, Icicle Group is a cross-media marketing and a creative production firm. 
um, super, uh, you know, a fantastic company that is very innovative um, in its own right. So, Bonnie, without further ado, please, please welcome Bonnie. To Thank you, Creative Mornings team, for putting this together. And since um, Julia is, is thanking everyone, I also want to have a, give a special thanks to my colleague, Mark Leonda. Um She's my partner in crime for this presentation, so it, it's good. So give all, her, uh, give all the credits to her. It's bad. Also, you know who to talk to. <laughs> so, <laughs> right. So, um, good morning, everyone. I'm Fanny. I'm your, I'm your presenter today for this topic, um, Global Theme of Ink. So, I uh, just want to do a quick survey here um, of every one of you today. If you had, um, if you had to use ink at all uh, to register to join this event this morning. That should be everyone. Quite a number of people. I, I thought, I, I guess none of you have to use anything, not even to mark your diary, because nowadays everything is on iPads, devices, and your phones. But anyway, um, I also wonder if Creative Mornings or the organizer had to require you to fill in a form, fax it back in, and wait for them to come back with a written confirmation that we get a free ticket if you would still be here this morning. So I think in this day and age of um, smartphones and internet, ink, is there still a place for it in our world? So that's the question that I want to pose today. What is the place of ink? So judging by our most recent experience of all of us here this morning for this event, I would say ink has a very small place, unfortunately. But, um, as I'm given this topic, I really want to do a bit more justice to this, um, to this word, ink. So allow me to share a little story, a personal story. Um, I think, like all of us, we all started schooling very early. We were given crayons when we were in kindergarten to draw, and then we progressed into primary school. We were given pencils to work on basic things, and then we became proud owners of biros when we got into um, secondary school, starting to work on algebra, writing composition, feeling a bit more grown up. When I was 14, my parents decided to send me to study in a boarding school in, in England. And I remember the boarding school sent my parents a shopping list to prepare me for the new academic experience with a shopping list, an authorized shopping list. You could uh, imagine a girl of 14 years old found a huge interest and in there, in that shopping list, there was one thing that stood out, and I think the only thing in that shopping list that still makes to my current shopping list is a fountain pen. And my parents uh, generously got me a very elegant practical fountain pen, which weighed pretty heavy in my hand at that point because you're used to write in biros. And then it, the, the ink flowed very smoothly. And when you, and when I, as I was writing with that fountain pen, I feel that what I was writing was a little bit more important than what I used to write. And you also feel, I also felt I was a bit more of a grown-up because I had to think ahead before I put my pen to the paper. And the ink flows very smoothly following my train of thoughts. But yet, with a fountain pen, it also smudges when you pause to hesitate. So that experience really stayed with me until, until today. And I felt that that fountain pen is part of the education because the flow of ink adds a dimension to the discipline of your thought process, from which I think I'm still benefiting. So um, thank you very much for listening to my personal story because the personal story especially, it doesn't actually add any meat to support that ink still has a place in the digital era because whatever happened in my little personal story actually happened before the genesis of the World Wide Web. So, <laughs> so it's irrelevant, but I still want to share it. <laughs> and and um, um, so being given this topic, I desperately, um, as I said, I wanted to do a bit more justice to it, especially this is a topic that is um, very dear to me and very relevant and rightly suited to me. I run a creative production company and printing is at the core of the business. And in fact, it is where my passion lies. So ink is important to me. So um, to start, 
I would uh, start with a brief history of ink. So around 2500 BC, ink was created by the Chinese and the Egyptian. They were mixing um, natural plant dyes with carbon, fine part carbon particles, and uh, they were constantly trying to improve the recipe. And around 4th century BC, Indian ink became very popular in China, and the Chinese made the ink from raw materials imported from India, um, like burnt bones and uh, um, tar, uh, mixing it. And then the ink would evolve um, continuously through the history of time, um, as it, uh, and most of the evolution would be related to the evolution of writing instruments. So in the 15th century, um, my hero Gutenberg um, invented the oil-based ink to work with his presses. And then the ink continued to transform through various scientific discoveries. Uh, to this day, you would find ink even in its solid form, also known as toner, which was which is developed to be used by desktop printers. So this history, so this history of ink shows you how ink has um, has has always been demanded by human, um, and the relevance of it is that it is a commercially successful product, at least all throughout history. And one thing, though, we wanted to ask, how much ink do we want as, as a person? And statistics show, show that every year, each of us spends about $3 US on ink, so each of us here in the room. And this is mainly through the print and packaging industry. So you didn't consciously go buy the ink, but you spend $3 on it. And some of you would, in the audience would ask, that's really a small amount of money. It's spare change compared to what you would be spending on, for example, data. You probably spend 10 times more than that uh, on data in a month alone. So um, what does this mean? This means ink really have a, doesn't really have a big place in, in, in our lives these days. So, so um, by standing here, obviously, I don't, I don't want to say ink is irre irrelevant. I wanted to say a bit more um, about the significance of ink beyond its commercial value. So if commercial value is three US dollars, what does it mean? I wanted to illustrate the significance of ink in other shapes and forms and how it has impacted humanity and, and our lives in the, in the daily world and why it is significant. So we can revisit this question at the end of the presentation, whether ink still has a place. Firstly, ink is a map. So in Judeo-Christian religions, God names things to create them. And it's like baptism acknowledges the existence of a human by giving that person a name. And in many Asian societies, families still try to name their children after getting to know them so that the names are relevant or match with the personality. We all need a name. And that name has to be able to be spoken and recorded and written in ink on ID papers, for example, and to be print. And ink is a, is a medium of an individual marker. Look at these tattoos. It signifies the, a belonging to a tribe, and it conveys a message. And you will see identity of people being marked in ink, on skin, on paper, um, even a number of a prisoner uh, or a slave to a master. So ink is a mark. Ink is also a messenger. This is a very obvious one. Um, ink is the mark of our humanity. From prehistoric caves to religious books to Chinese calligraphy, ink is a messenger. It is a carrier of information. It is the only way to share, preserve, keep information through long periods of time. And in this age, it is because of that that 
us get to know the beautiful sonnets of Shakespeare, the mesmerizing music of Bach, not because they're recorded in CDs, but because they scribed in ink. So they died, but their manuscripts survived. So somewhat, if some of you would ask, how about stone carvings? Surely stone carvings are much more long lasting. But stone carvings are very difficult to travel with and difficult to share. So civilizations such as the um, uh, Egyptians and Romans that uh, carved in stones, they left a grand passage in history, but they died eventually. And civilizations that used paper and ink to communicate and share information to enrich their culture actually evolved and survived. Ink is a weapon. Wars are declared with an official written notice. While ink, I would argue, is a weapon, digital is definitely less peace. Most recently, you would see terrorists spreading violent videos on the internet to declare wars against the Western world. And, that, and the way they do it without even penning a proper letter or, or declaration of law actually suggests how lawless and uncivilized they are with their approach to politics. The Western world, on the other hand, uh, still kept ink or writing in communication as part of their counter strategy to terrorism through the press and sometimes even through comics. So written and printed pieces are there to be shared, passed, uh, passed from people to people to convey very important messages, such as rules, laws, and, and stories and thoughts. In the digital, in the in digital world, ink is considered the ultimate, the ultimate medium as well. Digital messages can be deleted, can disappear, can, can get lost, can get hacked, but an ink marked paper, and in this case an ink marked door, has to be taken very, very seriously with a lot of attention. So if ink is war, ink is also defense. In its most natural form, ink is used by octopuses to defend themselves against enemies and potential threats. They would hide behind their own ink when enemies attack them. And humans also use ink to defend themselves against dark spirits. So some, some tribes in Southeast Asia, men would tattoo themselves all over the body to defend themselves against, uh, against spirits. And this is my favorite one, ink is also peace. So we are seeing that ink is a very serious matter. It's very powerful, it makes history, and history is made of it. And how ink plays in making peace. Democracy would allow every citizen to vote for their representatives to the government. And, and this has to be done with ink. A show of hands would not nearly be as democratic as, as a secret ballot, because that is subject to intimidation and peer group pressure. Powerful political forces are at play when each of us are casting our votes in a secret ballot with ink. And here is my favorite moment where ink played a part in making peace in history. In 1951, 18th of April, three presidents and three sovereigns um, signed a treaty. And this treaty was produced by the French stationary office on Dutch vellum using German ink. And it was bound in, in um, Belgian parchment with this Italian silk ribbon and Luxembourg blue. So this treaty was signed to form the European Steel and Coal Community, which is the foundation and the basis of the EU European Union today. And it was formed to maintain peace amongst the European countries after the Second World War. So this is a moment where ink played a part in history. And I would argue that if this treaty was to be signed today, the same type of production or even more elaborate production would take place to mark the significance of the event. 
it wouldn't be done on the internet by these three sovereigns and three presidents. So in my short presentation, we have reviewed ink being a mark, a messenger, a weapon, defense, and peace in far back history and today. In this digital age, I would say that ink will continue to be the lifeblood of our lives, not limited to just people in the creative community sitting here, but to the wider world. Although sending an email or posting a blog, which we do every day, would cost you next to nothing, and you'd think that being so economical by now, graceful writing on fine paper, printing, would be extinct. But the truth is, and in contrary to what some people would think, in this digital age where our lifestyles are so completely, incredibly plugged in, there is a renewed interest and craving for objects that are really, really tactile, reassuringly permanent. So to close my presentation, I want to show you one other image. This is a weekly newsletter that is shared, um, that was published by a designer. And it is um, quite paradoxical that it is shared as a JPEG image in a digital format of a handwritten, hand-drawn newsletter. So it shows how Link Inc. is the lifeblood of our lives and work. So I hope that I have given you a few reasons to share my view and my passion that that yes, ink still has a place, and a pretty important one, and a powerful one. So today, use ink to make your work significant, or just pick up a pen and write a personal note to someone that you feel is important. Make ink part of what you offer to the world. Happy creating with ink. Thank you. <laughs>
by promoting these types of production. So let's say uh, a letter pressed um, really nice invite that goes out. Uh, if you are a guest to the event, you don't want to throw it away. You probably keep it. People like me would actually keep it for life, but you probably <laughs> keep it very nicely in your office. And you look at it, it's so beautiful that you don't throw away. And behind it, there would be a craftsman actually working behind the letterpress, pressing on it. And that whole labor, um, that, that concept of, of labor and craftsmanship is what we want to preserve in our society. Um, so obviously, with the flyers that you get on the street, those ones that you chuck it away at the next moment. But yes, that's a waste. But that doesn't mean that we want to give up um, production of ink and paper altogether. Mm -hmm.